Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast, the place to be for drama teachers, drama students, and theater educators everywhere. I'm Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello, I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. Welcome to episode 129. 129. You can find any links for this episode in the show notes at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 129. Okay, we're talking voice. You know, I think about these things about half a second before I'm about to do them. And then sometimes I get in the middle of them and I'm like, nah, you shouldn't have made that choice. <laughs> anyway, we're talking voice today. Uh, I, specifically, a couple of different avenues. We're going to be talking to two teachers today. We're talking about incorporating vocal technique into the drama classroom and then succeeding with choral work. So Elizabeth Oppelt uh, wants you not only to teach your students how to use their voice, she's adamant about that, and I, I love that. And she's also, she wants you, you, the drama teacher, she wants you to take care of your voice and to make sure that you're not stretching and straining in the same way that we don't want our students to. So that's Elizabeth. And then I'm going to speak to uh, teacher Keith White. He's in Florida right now. Although when I talked to him, I learned that he actually uh, grew up almost metaphorically around the corner from where I am right now, which is always cool. Small world. And he did one of my plays, Stupid is Just for Today, which has a lot of choral, vocal choral work in it. And he's got some great tips for getting the most out of your students when you're doing choral work. But first, let's talk to Elizabeth. <music> All right, I am talking to Liz Oppelt. Hello, Liz. Hi. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. You're doing all right. You and tell everybody where you are in the world. I am in Yuma, Arizona, which is about as far south as you can get before you cross into Mexico. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's very far from us. So we're going to talk about voice and voice in the uh, getting your students to use their voices properly, using voice in the drama classroom. Uh, but before we do that, let's just hear a little bit about you. You are a drama teacher. I am. And how long have you been one? Uh, this is my second year teaching full-time drama. What made you decide to take that on? Um, I didn't intend to. I was going to be a lawyer and then I was going to be a history teacher, but I got the theater bug in high school and I thought I could let it go and I couldn't. And I love, I'm not much of an actor, but I love to direct and I love to stage manage. And so teaching gave me the chance to do all of those things. And then I started working with teenagers and figured out I liked it. And so it, it worked out well for me. Which is very funny because sometimes working with teenagers is the thing that people, it's not high on their list, is it? Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Director, I, I think high school drama teachers are, are a very, very special breed. And I, and I, uh, and I love hearing about how it's like, nope, this is what I, this is what I want to do. And I love that, that you just said that I, you got the bug in high school and it just, it just never left you. Why do you think that never left? What, what was it about drama that sticks with you? I don't, for me, it's, this, I think the storytelling of it, the fact that there are so many stories that can be told and told in so many unique ways. Theater is, you know, it's not bound by traditional scripts or by traditional film ideas. You can pretty much, as long as it works on stage, you can do it. And so there's so much room for creativity. There's so much room for what's the best way to tell this story. And that's what I love about it. It's so much fun to do. Oh, I love that. That's lovely. Uh, and you also have um, some uh, voice background. I do. Um, I've been taking voice lessons and singing in choirs for about 15 years. And what is it? What is it about singing that sticks with you? Well, it started with I didn't want to take piano lessons anymore, and so my parents put me in voice, which was fun. But I, I love singing. To me, it's a way to express emotions in a way that can't be done through speaking. And I love choral singing. I love the ensemble feel of that the whole we're working together to create something new and create something beautiful and so I and it's the one art form that I haven't really taught and so it's still kind of mine and so that's what I love about singing I, I've used the skills but I've never actually taught singers right if that makes sense and let's okay well, wonderful segue so let's get into that let's get into this whole notion of using the voice at the at the high school level it's not something that that students really know how to do instinctually at all, is it? No, no, it's not. And uh, why is it? And I think the thing that we we see so often, I know I do. I adjudicate, um, uh, I adjudicate a lot. And even when I'm adjudicating a a monologue, and someone is standing like you know 
you know, right in front of me. I'm like, I can't hear you. I can't hear mm-hmm. you. Uh, why is it? Why do you think that students have so much trouble with projection? Um, I think it's a couple of things. For some, it's nerves. When we get nervous, a lot of us tend to get quieter. And so, you know, students are performing and they're nervous. And so they just, their volume drops. And it's also the issue of just not used to doing it. You know, very rarely are they in situations where they have to be heard in a large space. And so they haven't done it before. And so it's not a skill that they've had to learn. And so I think the combination of those two things is what puts students in a place where they can't make themselves heard because they've never had to. And it's, uh, well, being on stage is kind of an odd thing, right? I, I, uh, I see a lot of students and they're having a conversation with their fellow actor and it's really great and it's going really well but it's like they're not uh, including the audience in their experience yeah Yeah, it's like we're here doing our thing and the audience isn't there which is not the point of theater at all so what's one thing that teachers can do to um, address the projection issue Um, first of all give the skills give the students the skills they need to project because a lot of kids they hear be louder and they start yelling and that can cause damage to the vocal cords and so you don't want to put your students in a place where they're doing damage to their bodies and so teaching them the skills to project okay this is how you do this and then really just pushing them on it I know even just in my classroom if I can't hear my students make a comment I make them repeat it until they can hear until I can hear them you know and even if we're just in a small space just making sure that I push it a lot and with my advanced kids it's always there's someone in the back of the auditorium during rehearsal being I can't hear you and just making sure that they become aware of how loud they need to be because for most of them they think they be they're being loud but then when it comes down to it they're not and it's something that just takes practice isn't it it really is it's They get upset because, oh, I can't do this. And I'm saying, you're not going to be able to do it the first or second time you do it. It's going to take some practice. Because another thing that seems to be happening more and more and more is that um, teachers aren't necessarily addressing the projection. They're just miking their actors. Yeah. And to me, that bothers me for a couple of reasons. First of all, because the number of times a mic decides to go out during a show you know, batteries die or it starts to scream, especially the mics that we have access to for schools, they're not, they're old, (laughs) they're not super great quality, and so they go out. And then your actors, because they've been relying on the microphone, no one can hear them. And not most high school auditoriums are small enough that you don't need to mic. And so for me, I don't mic in my auditorium ever, and my students hate it. But they, (laughs) I can fill that space easily, and they can fill that space easily. And uh, well, and, and you know, and even further to that, sound mixing is like that is a that is an art. It's like oh, it's, it, is. it can it it it's <laughs> it, it's not something as it's not as simple as you know plugging in some mics and going okay here you go. Yeah, and that's assuming that you have you know decent equipment. And I know that most schools were fighting with their equipment, and so it's easier if you that's one less thing you have to try to fight with during a show. Which to <laughs> me is great because there's always a million other things to worry about. If you don't have to worry about that, then that's one less thing on your plate. That's right. Teach them here. There you go. There's your there's your tip for today. How about teach them teach them the skill instead of buying a microphone. I'm all for that. <laughs> so okay. So let's let's give a time frame. How how long does it take? How long does it take to practice uh, to for your students to get to the art of projection? Like if you're using a drama one class, um, how long do you work on it? Um, the whole unit. For, and I include other skills like memorization and articulation, but that whole unit, I'm trying to think I just taught it, probably takes around a month and a half. And so, it must be pretty, yeah, it must be pretty amazing at the end of that month when they, I'm sure at the beginning they're like, well, there's no way I can do this. Yeah, and then at the end, I'm going, okay, I could hear all of you. And they get really excited because, especially my little quiet ones who are terrified, suddenly they're, oh, I can I can be heard. That is exciting. And so it's a fun thing to see to go from these little these quiet kids to suddenly they're standing in an auditorium and they can be heard. So it's a cool thing. Let's talk about articulation for a moment, because that's the other thing in terms of vocal vocal um, qualities. That is my that's my huge pet peeve is I cannot understand what you are saying. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with articulation with high school students? Um, well, I teach, I teach articulation as far as tongue twisters and just getting them used to speaking clearly. And then when they're on stage, a lot of times it's, well, now I know my lines, so I'm just powering through them. And so focusing on slowing down and taking your time and actually saying what you're saying. Because a lot of times it's, now I have my lines and they quit acting. They're just reciting. And so I found if I can get them back into what is your character saying and why then the articulation gets a little better because they slow down and they're thinking about it. 
Hey, and I know one thing I want to uh, uh, just go back to about um, projection is that um, projection is not just for students. Um, I I think that uh, a lot of, uh, t- in terms of like taking care of your voice, I think teachers can like do a lot of damage to their vocal cords too if they like spend a lot of time yelling. Oh yeah, I worked with a teacher who she yelled a lot and she had to have surgery on her vocal cords and that freaked me out. I'm going, wow, just from teaching you can do that much damage. And so I, you know, I do my best to make sure I'm not yelling because I don't want to damage my voice like that. Yeah, how do you take care of your voice to make sure that doesn't happen? Well, for me, again, it's projecting when I'm talking. Um, I try not to be yelling, especially when I'm teaching in the auditorium. I make sure that I'm standing up straight and I take a big breath in and I make sure that I'm projecting when I'm in that space. I also sometimes will use other ways to get my students' attention if they're being really loud. I'll use like a bell or something so that way I'm not having to scream over them constantly. Sweet. Okay, so uh, if you had like top three top um, pieces of advice for uh, drama directors, uh, high school directors in terms of getting students to use their voice, what would they be? Um, first, give them the skill set they need. Make sure that you've taught them how to speak correctly. Don't assume they know how. Um, second would be really just encouraging them to practice and making sure they understand that no, you're not magically going to understand this overnight. And then third, make sure that they know it's okay to mess up. Make sure they know it's okay that no, you don't have to do this perfectly. But I just want to see you trying and learning those skills. And so taking away the pressure of you have to do this perfectly right. So that way they have room to experiment and explore and understand the material. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much, Liz. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. So now we're going to talk to Keith and um, the play Stupid is Just for Today. He, uh, I talked to him at the Florida Junior State Thespian Festival, and uh, he's going to talk about the challenges and the rewards of choral work. There are both, and uh, it was really great to hear him talk about how he approaches choral work. <laughs> Hey, I am standing here with Keith White. How are you? I'm really well. How are you? Uh, I'm good. So Great. you must be sort of like a little bit on cloud nine. You, yeah. Your students have just performed uh, Stupid is Just for Today. Yep. At the Florida Junior State Thespian Festival. That's correct. Yep. And uh, how did you feel it went? Um, I felt like we did really well. There was a lot of energy. I told the kids after they performed it that I felt it was the best they had ever done it, which was a big deal because they, they have had several rehearsals and their district competition where they knocked it out of the park. But this was really, really good. So oh, they have is, a lot to be proud of. That is so exciting to hear. It's so nice when they're like they culminate at the right yeah. exact moment. Yeah. So what I wanted to talk to you about is that Stupid has a lot of uh, uh, and just come this way as they start singing. St- Stupid has a lot of choral work. Um, there's a lot of group speaking. Um, it's some somewhat rhythmic in in nature. So how did you approach that in your rehearsals? Um, the first thing that I decided was that I was going to have our junior thespian president, who tends to be our most reliable student, um, I decided that we were going to break down all of the choral things um, that keep coming up throughout the show with her starting them. That way we got into a rhythm and everything was very clear and uh, in sync. And then um, one of the things that I felt was really important was getting the overture really, really strong. Right. Um, before we worked on any of the individual scenes or any of the other movements because I felt it was extremely important to set a great tone for the show and be perfect on the overture. Um, so, so how we, long did you rehearse the overture? We spent, uh, I would say probably six block rehearsals and block rehearsals are about 80 minutes. So we spent a whole lot of time working on that. And then after that, everything just seemed to start to roll along really well. I decided to put together a kind of a study sheet for them for all their ensemble things. Really? I broke down, I went into the script and broke down every single cue for any of these stupid, ugh, stupid, ah, stupid O's, and then made sure that they had their cue line, whether they were doing a movement with it or not, and then they were able to take that home with their script and the study sheet and do everything that they needed I to I love prepare. that. I think that's a really great idea. Like, if you're doing that kind of, because all of the ensemble, all the choral stuff, most of it had a had an action or there was something very specific yeah. going on in it so to give them a guide give them guidance you know so they sort of have a okay this is what you have to do what a great what a really great idea um, and I also really like having someone who's sort of the the leader 
so that no one has to decide yes. who's going to go first. Everybody knows who's going to go first. Yep, and it also worked um, because w when certain things are ending and there's there's a specific thing that needs to be said by the tutti, um, I wanted to make sure that everyone was starting at the right right time and having a leader for that made sure everybody was starting at the exact right time. Uh, were there any struggles with the, with the choral work? The biggest struggle was trying to get things that happened in the individual movements down in the students' heads because once we got into the movements, there were some times where they would say the title of the movement together. There were some times where they would go, stupid, uh, stupid, ah, stupid, oh. Um, and, and just getting them to be really concrete and focused. One of the things that I told them is make sure you're not packing your lunch for tomorrow in your head while there's this scene going on. Make sure you're not thinking about what's happening with your boyfriend or yes. sports or anything like that. You have to be focused on what is my very next objective and when do I have to say it. And um, it we, we went through growing pains and ebbs and flows throughout this entire rehearsal process, even after we did well at the district festival. Um, in the two months getting ready for state. So, uh, but we peaked at the right point, peaked I felt. at the right point. Yep, I felt like we did. Well, you can't ask for anything more than that. No, and I really like to, you know, I think it's really important with choral work that, that there is some kind of objective behind it, that it's not just, okay, everyone's saying words at the same time and it's pretty. Yeah. There has to be more to it than that. Yeah. And that, do you think, and you think that helped them out? Yeah, I think it really did. Um, and we had, uh, we have a very good relationship with the Center of the Arts High School, and we're a Center of the Arts Middle School. And so their uh, teacher uh, came over to adjudicate them a couple of weeks ago to prepare for this. And one of the things that we were both agreeing on was that objectives. He, he kept saying it, and then when they heard him say it, <laughs> and a lot of them have the goal of going to that high school next year, they kind of looked at me and they said, oh, Mr. White knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and he's right if Mr. Lodi is saying it. So we got to make sure everything is 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 pinpoint. It's not always the way. It's always when someone, when a stranger, <laughs> when a visiting, I get that all, a visiting guest yeah. artist comes in and says it. It's like, that's so yeah. amazing. It's like, I've been saying that all, all this all time. All day long, yep. Is this the first time these students have done choral work? Or have they done it before? I would say yes. Um, some of them have, in terms of singing um, backgrounds, right, right. but but in terms of a play like this, this would be the first time that they've done something to this caliber, caliber. of this caliber, awesome. magnitude, magnitude, awesomeness. How's that? <laughs> I, I I try. I'm a writer, and I'm like, I have no other words. That's what the thoruses are for. Uh, thank you so much for talking to me. I really like. I like some of these. Uh, I think some of these points are just really awesome to pass on in terms of choral work, in terms of leaders and study sheets and objectives. And, and I think uh, we were um, our students were a little intimidated yeah. by it, even though they chose to do it and they were really excited about it. They were a little intimidated once we got into the beginning of the rehearsal process and we started the overture and they realized how much work it was going to take. Um, but I think that if a strong tone is set and there are really strong leaders in the group, then that can it, this can be a show that young, young actors. actors if they're really dedicated and really want to do it, they, they can do well with it. And it's a challenge. It's a, it's a very difficult show. But I think that it, it's, it's so fun. It's such a fun show. They, they walk out of, of rehearsal going, stupid, uh, stupid, ah, uh, down the hall. And, and the other classmates, students from, from other classes are like, what are you doing? But it's, uh, they loved it. They, you know, they had a blast. And that's so. awesome. And I really like, too, that why not give middle school students a challenge? Yeah. And I think that's important to, and a good note to end on is that choral work is work. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Keith. Before we go, let's do some theater folk news. So Elizabeth is one of our Drama Teacher Academy instructors, and we have just recently uploaded her course, Breath Control and Projection. That's right, a whole course on how you can get your students to not only take care of their voices, but how to use and understand the breath. Everything in the voice comes from the breath. You know, if you're out of breath, if you're uh, holding your breath, uh, you're not going to get the, the best sound 
out of your actors. And it's so important. It's uh, breath is uh, directly connected to projection. You know, how do we get students to project so they don't need to use those microphones? And also she talks a bit about, uh, she's a drama teacher, so she talks about how to assess these exercises. And I know that's something that everybody, everybody wants to know. So go to dramateacheracademy.com, check on, uh, check on Elizabeth's course, Breath Control and Projection. Everybody can go to the site and check out her first video. Uh, you can see what it's all about, kick the tires, and uh, see if the Drama Teacher Academy is something that you might be interested in. You can also click the link in the show notes at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 129. Finally, where, oh, where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every second Tuesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com forward slash theaterfolk and you can find us on the Stitcher app. You can also subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search for the word theater folk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care. <laughs>